In this presentation, we will take a look at some items in Luke chapters 12 through 17, and then John chapter 11. I would encourage you to read the chapters, as we will not cover everything, but at least you'll get a background of what we are talking about and some of the details of what we will be discussing today. So first of all, let's take a look at Luke chapter 12, verses 1 through 8, and also the Joseph Smith translation of Luke 12, 9 through 12. Whom should we fear and respect? Starting with Luke 12, 1 through 8, it says in verse 1, In the meantime, when there were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trod one upon another, he began to say in his disciples, first of all, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Therefore, whosoever ye, ye have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, and that which ye have spoken in the ear in the closet shall be pronounced upon the housetops. In other words, we're not going to be able to hide anything from the Savior and from our Heavenly Father. All things shall be known to them. Verse 4, And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. The worst men can do to us, and it can be bad, I'm not dismissing it. The worst man can do to us is to kill our physical body. But the resurrection will take care of that, and we will all be resurrected. But now notice what he says in verse 5. But I will forewarn you whom you shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Well, who is that? That is our Father in heaven. Not only can he kill the physical body, but he can also kill the spiritual body. He can cause spiritual death, being separated from him for eternity. That is who we should fear and respect. Fear meaning having awe and respect for him. That is who we should respect is our Father in heaven. He can do far worse to us than man could ever do. And are not five sparrows sold for two farthings, and not one of them is forgotten before God? But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, ye are more valued than many sparrows. Also I say unto you, Whosoever shall confess me before men, him shall the Son of Man also confess him before the angels of God. Now he's starting to warn them a little bit about joining the church, following the doctrines, gaining a witness, and then turning from it and fearing man more than fearing his Father in heaven, fearing God. Listen to what he says in the Joseph Smith translation now of Luke 12, 9 through 12. He kind of explains how some of his disciples are starting to turn on him, or I should say turn from him. Uh, that which is in the bold is what Joseph Smith uh, added in the Joseph Smith translation. But he who denieth me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. Verse 10. Now his disciples knew that he said this because they had spoken evil against him before the people, for they were afraid to confess him before men. Now, disciples means followers here, not the twelve apostles, but some of his followers are afraid of what the people will think of them. And so the peer pressure is getting to them, and they're not confessing the Savior before men as they have gained a witness of him and started to follow him. Verse 11, And they reasoned among themselves, saying, He knows our hearts, and he speaketh to our condemnation and we shall not be forgiven. But he answered them and said unto them, verse 12, Whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man and repent, it shall be forgiven him. 
but unto him who blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him. So he's starting to warn them that if you say things against me and not confess me, there is still forgiveness. But be very careful if you gain a sure witness from the Holy Ghost, a witness beyond denial, then you're running into not being forgiven. And so he's starting to warn them. And warning all of us of the same thing. Let's turn now to the Joseph Smith translation of Luke 12, 38 through 45. Those who wait for the Lord. Verse 38. Let your loins be girded about and have your lights burning. That ye yourselves may be like unto men who wait for the Lord when he shall return from the wedding that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. He is speaking in reference to his second coming here, comparing it to a wedding and those who wait for the wedding party to come and that they're ready to join the wedding party when it comes, regardless of when it is. Verse 40, Verily I say unto you, Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. For he shall gird himself and make them sit down to meet, and he will come forth and serve them. Blessed are any of us who are prepared and ready for the Savior. And we must prepare the time, for we know not the hour nor the time in which he cometh. Those whom Christ shall find watching at his second coming, he will invite to share in his final feast, the joy of heaven when he himself will serve them, supplying them with all blessedness and wiping away all tears from their eyes. That was from the great professor Dumlow, Bible scholar. Now, Joseph Smith adds one, two, three, four, five complete verses that were taken out of the King James Version. In Luke chapter 12, verses 41 through 45, listen to what he says here. It seems a little confusing. For behold, he cometh in the first watch of the night, and he also cometh in the second watch. And again, he cometh in the third watch. How does Christ come in all those times, and yet it's his second coming? See, it's kind of confusing. What is he talking about here? We'll see this in just a minute. And verily I say unto you, he hath already come. Well, what's he talking about there? As it is written of him. And again, when he shall come in the second watch and come in the third watch, blessed are those servants when he cometh that he shall find so doing. For the Lord of those servants shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet, and he will come forth and serve them. Verse 44, And now verily I say these things unto you, that ye may know this, that the coming of the Lord is as a thief in the night. And it is likened to a man who is an householder, who, if he watcheth not his goods, the thief cometh in an hour of which he is not aware, and taketh his goods, and divideth them among his fellows. That's why we constantly need to be waiting for the Lord, and waiting upon him, and being prepared for his coming. Now, what is he talking about with the first watch, the second watch, the third watch, and he has already come? Well, we know that hasn't happened in his second coming. Well, in reference to this, Elder Bruce R. McConkie explains what he is talking about. He writes, concerning what we've just read, inserted in the inspired version by Revelation, these sayings of Jesus give a new and added concept to the teaching that men should watch, pray, and be ready for the second coming. They outline a concept which is not elsewhere set forth in the clarity and plainness here recorded. Interesting Dumlow came close to the very truth Jesus is here teaching when he speculated, as above quoted, that Christ's return from the marriage feast may mean his judgment of each individual soul at death. All of the Lord's ministers, all of the members of the church, and for that matter, all men everywhere, what I say unto one, I say unto all, are counseled to wait with righteousness, readiness, with righteous readiness, the coming of the Lord. 
However, most men will die before he comes, and only those then living will rejoice or tremble, as the case may be, at his personal presence. But all who did prepare will be rewarded as though they had lived when he came while the wicked will be cut asunder and appointed their portion with the hypocrites, as surely as though they lived in the very day of dread and vengeance. So that's what he's talking about when he says, if I come in the first watch or the second or the third, it means if you die before my second coming, if you were prepared and ready as if I had come, it will be the same thing. Brothers and sisters, Death is just the reverse of the second coming. The second coming is when Christ comes down and makes judgment upon the earth. Death is when we return to Christ and have judgment placed upon us. And so he's talking about no matter when you lived or when you died, be ready for his coming. For those who are ready, even if they have died before his actual second coming, will be rewarded for their righteousness and their readiness. Thus, in effect, the Lord comes in every watch of the night. On every occasion, this is a McConkie again, when men are called to face death and judgment. The phrase, he hath already come, as it is written of him, pointedly inserted in verse 42, is a witness that even then, he ministered among mortal men and that they were judged by their acceptance or rejection of him. So when he was living upon the earth, he was saying, prepare yourselves and be ready. Even now, even though I'm already here for my first coming, still prepare for the second and be ready. Let's go to Luke chapter 14 now, verses 25 through 33, counting the cost. This is the famous story of building a building, and you count the cost before you build it. Verse 25, And there were great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me, and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brother and sister or husband, yea, in his own life also, or in other words, is afraid to lay down, and his life for my sake cannot be my disciple. We must be willing to give everything for the Lord. Verse 27, And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Wherefore, settle this in your hearts, that ye do those things which I teach you and command you. There's a great principle here, brothers and sisters. Are we settled? Have I settled that, yes, this is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This is his kingdom. This is his gospel, regardless of the imperfect people that are in it. This is it. I am settled. I will follow it. And I have no more doubts. And I am settled. And I am determined to follow him. Verse 28, For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first, and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Least happily, after he laid the foundation, and is not able to finish it, all that beholdeth begin to mock him. Don't we sit down and count and see if we have enough to build before we start? saying, This man began to build and was, able, and was not able to finish. And this he said, signifying that there should not any man follow him unless he was able to continue, saying, Or what king going to war maketh war against another king, sitteth not down first, and counteth the cost, counteth whether he be able with ten thousand to meet him that cometh against him with twenty thousand. Or else, while the others yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and, and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be thy disciple. God requires complete consecration out of all of us. Have we set down and count the cost before we start? Now, before you think, well, boy, that's too much, I'm not going to start. 
think of the converse of this. What is the cost of not building the tower, of not joining the kingdom and giving your all to Jesus Christ? Well, then you lose everything, don't you? See, there is a cost to everything, whether we join or whether we don't join the kingdom. There is a cost to be paid. Do you count the cost not consecrating yourselves to Jesus Christ? Giving up everything through Christ, I will eventually gain everything in the eternal worlds to come. Not consecrating my life to Christ, I may gain things here on earth, but I will lose everything in eternity. May we be wise in counting the cost. Understanding parables, Joseph Smith stated something very important. He said, I have a key by which I understand the scriptures. I inquire what was the question which drew out the answer or caused Jesus to utter the parable. That will help you understand what the parable is out. What caused him to give the parable in the first place? What was he trying to illustrate? And so I'm going to show that instead of going through each parable, you can read those and take a look at it with this key. First of all, Luke 14, verses 16 through 24, the parable of the Great Supper. This is where the king has a great supper, and he invites all of the guests that are bidden, and they won't come. They make excuses. And so he goes out into the highway to invite anyone who will come. Well, what caused him to give that parable? What caused the parable? In Luke 14, 7 through 14, at a supper of one of the chief priests, Jesus has just taught about not exalting yourself to be seen of men. And when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. See, then Jesus gives the parable of the great supper. Here he was chastising the Pharisees for trying to exalt themselves. There were certain positions and where you sat when you were invited into people's house that showed how important you were. And he was kind of chastising them for being so caught up in their hypocrisy and in their supposedly greatness of themselves and exalting themselves. And one yells out, well, when God comes... Blesses he that he bred in his in God's kingdom. And so Jesus gives the parable, yeah, but it won't be any of you who exalt yourselves because you will not come when I bid you to come. That's what causes him to give that parable. Luke fifteen, three through thirty two, the parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the prodigal son, well known about who loses one sheep and you leave the ninety and nine or you lose a coin and you sweep and you do all you can to find it. What caused the parable? Luke 15, 1 through 2 says, Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, This man receives sinners and eateth with them. So the Pharisees are comparing the publicans and sinners to sinners, and he is eating with them. That's what causes him to give the parable, saying, I have come to find those who are lost, not the righteous. I haven't come to save the righteous. I have come to save those who are lost and those who are sinners, and that's why I am with them and helping them and preaching to them and encouraging them to come unto me. And if you think about it, because it says, In heaven there is more joy over one who repenteth than the ninety-nine who are righteous. Well, brothers and sisters, there is no such thing as ninety-nine that are righteous. We are all sinners. That was the Pharisees' problem. They thought they were righteous and needed no repentance. That's why he gives the parable. Even the prodigal son, the Pharisees are the prodigal sons, or, or the I should say the publicans and sinners are the prodigal sons who are coming back to him after sinning. The one son who has stayed but who is prideful and who is upset because no feast was thrown for him, that would be the Pharisees who are very prideful. 
See, they're both in trouble, the prodigal son and the son who stayed, who is prideful. Pride can cause just as much problem as any other sin that we may commit that would keep us out of the kingdom. This is also the setting for the parable in Luke 16, 1 through 12, of the unjust steward, which is directed to Jesus' disciples on how they can learn a lesson from those in the world who have enough foresight to look after themselves. We should be as concerned about our spiritual welfare as those in the world are concerned about their temporal welfare. So read that parable in Luke 16, 1 through 12, and keep that in mind as you read it. Because the Savior praises the unjust steward who goes and does some unjust things, he has to give an account to his master, and he, he's been dishonest in some of his things, and so he goes to each of his people and says, how much do you owe? Well, cut it in half and pay me that, and, and that will be good enough. And he praises him for what he does. And for what he's saying is at least he has enough insight to look after himself in the world and to take care of himself. We should have as much concern about our eternal welfare as those in the world do for their temporal welfare. Luke 17, 5, And the apostles said unto the Lord, Increase our faith. And so he gave two ways that will increase our faith, brothers and sisters. Number one, Luke 17, verse 6, And the Lord said, If you have the faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye might say unto the sycamore tree, Be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. This is not referring to the size of our faith, but to the quality of our faith. Just as a tiny mustard seed can grow into a large bush or tree, some six to eight feet high, if nurtured, so too must our faith be a growing faith and nurtured. A man's faith cannot exceed his righteousness and obedience. The greater the adherence to the truth, the greater is the faith of the individual. And so that's what he's referring to by the grain of mustard seed. Have growing faith, obedient, righteous faith. Not the size, not a tiny little bit of faith, but growing faith through obedience and righteousness, adherence to the truth. And then number two in Luke 17, 7 through 10, he gives the parable to the unprofitable servant. This parable teaches that we grow in faith by obedience and service in the kingdom and that God has claim upon the servants, the service of his saints. Though we may serve him with all our hearts, might, mind, and strength, we are still unprofitable servants. This is what Mosiah chapter 2, 21 through 24 was trying to get across when he states, I say unto you that if you should serve him who has created you from the beginning and is preserving you from day to day by lending you breath that ye may live and move and do according to your own will and even supporting you from one moment to another, I say if you should serve him with all of your whole souls, yet you would be unprofitable servants. And behold, all that it requires of you is to keep his commandments. And he has promised you that if you keep his commandments, ye should prosper in the land. And he never doth vary from that which he saith. Therefore, if you do keep his commandments, he doth bless you and prosper you. And now in the first place he hath created you and granted unto you your lives, for which you are indebted unto him. And secondly, he doth require that you should do all he hath commanded, for which if you do, he doth immediately bless you, and therefore he hath paid you, and ye are still indebted to him, and are and will be forever, and therefore there what have ye to boast. And so how true that is. And so the parable of the unprofitable servant, we want to increase our faith, increase our obedience and service in the kingdom of our Father in heaven. John chapter 11, verses 25 through 26, how Christ is the resurrection and the life. Because those seem to be two, the same thing. Well, the resurrection is life, 
but it notes his resurrection and the life. In verse 25, Jesus said unto her, uh, Mary, this is Mary and Martha and Lazarus, if you remember the story when he comes back and he has died, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Verse 26, And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believe thou this? Now Joseph, President Joseph Fielding Smith commented on this and said, Christ declared himself to be the one sent by the Father to bring to pass the redemption from the grave of all men. To Martha's pleading at the tomb of Lazarus, the Lord said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Here are two thoughts expressed which have appeared confusing to many, yet his meaning is plain. As the resurrection and the life, he had power to bring forth from their grave all the children of Adam. In giving to those who believe on him the power that they should never die, he had no reference to the mortal or physical disillusion, but to the second death, which is banishment from the presence of God. This second death from which the righteous are freed is the condemnation of those who are coincigned to immortality outside of the kingdom of God. So one, Christ is the resurrection. All will be resurrected. Two, he is the life. He'll give eternal life to those who qualify for it. And then John chapter 11, verses 38 through 39, I titled this, The Stone. Lazarus has died. He's been put in a tomb. A stone has been rolled over the entrance. And notice there's a great principle taught here that is easily missed. Verse 38, Jesus, therefore, again groaning in himself, cometh to the grave. It was a cave, and a stone lay upon it. And Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, said unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Now, Jesus could have easily used his priesthood power and just with the stroke of his hand moved the stone himself. Wouldn't that have been impressive? Wouldn't that have caught their attention if he miraculously moved the stone away? But he tells them to take away the stone. Here is the great principle, I think, that is being taught here. Jesus will not do for us what we can do for ourselves. That is something they could do. They could roll the stone themselves away from the entrance. But they could not call forth Lazarus from the dead. Jesus will take care of that which we cannot do for ourselves. But he expects us, brothers and sisters, to do for ourselves that which we can. And so sometimes in our prayers, maybe we're asking him to do things that we can already do for ourselves. Something to think about and to contemplate. Well, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button and consider subscribing to the channel.